So before we uh, get started on the main topic, I would beg your indulgence uh, because I want to talk about something else, uh, namely giving back to the community. Um, as at least some of you know, uh, in January of this year, I started working for a, a small boutique software company based in Waldorf, Germany, known as SAP. Um, and uh, as part of me coming on board, one of the things that I discussed with my, uh, my boss, uh, Harold Monahart, was that we wanted to start giving back to the Mac and Min community with the resources that we had. And um, I'm happy to say that uh, the first of those fruits uh, is being announced today. Is your mic on? Is my mic on? Hello? That's better. All right. Still talking? All right. Is it bent the other way? Hang on. Come on, second. How's this? Yeah. Uh, all right. So, like I was saying, the first of our fruits is being revealed today. Uh, this is uh, the first of hopefully more to come open sourced applications. This one is called Icons. And it does a pretty simple little job. You launch icons, and you can drop just about any source of graphical information onto it. Um, choose what size you want it to be. Hit Save. And what that'll do, uh, it'll prompt you where you want to save things to. You say Choose. And then that'll give you a folder with three graphics files inside of it. So what's cool about this? Well, because Icons will allow you, if you say have a monkey and managed software center or jam prone use uh, self-service, this is a quick way to make PNG icons, um, both for install, uninstall, and if you notice, we even have an uh, animated PNG option that gives you that fun little uh, uninstall shake. Um, so, you know, it's a simple little thing, but th we found uh, that by using the, uh, the animated uninstall, it gave a lot better feedback to our users on what policies in our self-service were meant to install things and what were meant to uninstall. So for the install policy, they see that, you know, just regular circle or whatever the icon is. And for the uninstall, they see a little shaky. And uh, we have had a few uh, bits of feedback that people have tried to click on the X and it doesn't actually uninstall your stuff. But cool little app and like I said, the first of more to come. So where do you get this from? Uh, we are up on GitHub um, at the following address. I'm going to leave that up on the screen for a second. We'll also be posting this to Twitter. Um, you'll probably be seeing more about this uh, pop up on uh, SAP Twitter feeds over the next couple days. And also, because we want to make sure that people can get this, we also have auto package recipes for this. So install, JSS, PKG, and download recipes are available. And just uh, auto package search. You can either auto package search icons, or you can search specifically for where they are in my GitHub repo. So I thank you for your patience. And now, let us move on. So before we get started, uh, there are two things I'd like to mention. The first is that all the slides, speakers, notes, and the demos are available for download. And I'll be providing a link at the end of the talk. Um, I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time. So for those folks in the same situation, no need to take notes. Everything I'm covering is going to be available for download. And the second is to please hold all questions until the end. Uh, if you've got questions, make a note of them and ask me afterwards during the Q&A. But with luck, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So in the beginning, which for this discussion is 1984, there was the Macintosh file system. This file system was introduced with the original Macintosh computer in January 1984, and was designed to store files on 400 kilobyte floppy disks. So MFS had a number of features that would be familiar to later Macintosh users. Uh, the first is that it introduced resource forks as a way to accomplish the following. It allowed graphical data to be stored on disk until it was needed. That allowed uh, the OS to retrieve that data into a precious memory, uh, draw it on the screen, and then discard it from memory to free up that memory for other things. Resource Forks also allowed easier translation of applications for a foreign market. So all the pictures, text, everything else graphical um, that was related to an application were stored in the Resource Fork. So only that needed to be edited in order to make an application available for a different language or nation. 
And resource forks also allowed the distribution of all, or at least almost all, the components of an application inside of a single file. And this simplified application installation and removal. And of course, the other feature that MFS introduced was storing the metadata needed to support a graphical user interface. Uh, and that was starting with System 1 in 1984. So one feature that was different from how Mac file systems work today is that MFS did not support the concept of a hierarchy of directories. Instead, MFS was a flat file system where all the files were actually being stored at the same level. So folders existed as a concept in MFS, but they work completely differently from the way that they do on modern file systems. So the finder created the illusion of folders that were visible in the finder, but then they weren't visible in the save and open dialog boxes of applications. And there was always a folder called empty folder that could be used to create new folders in the finder by altering the existing empty folder. So as folders were altered by adding files to them or by renaming the directory, a new empty folder would then appear. So in reality, in the background, what the file system was really doing was it was uh, using a directory and file handle pairing to track files. And when you opened a folder, what the file system was doing was actually running a search for everything that matched that particular directory and file handle pairing and then displaying the contents of that search as the folder contents. So let's take a look at how this worked way back in the day. So I've got my data drive here. This is uh, system one. Got empty folder, throwing it away in the trash. Uh, bulging trash can is still in the future at this point. Uh, now we've got empty trash, but to make it recognize the change, we need to quit out of Finder. And how we're going to do that, let's go over to our boot disk, uh, launch teach text, which will quit Finder. And let's go ahead and quit out of teach text. All right, that relaunches Finder. Let's go ahead and close out of our boot disk. Go back to our data drive, and there we go. Empty folder is back again. So MFS had the following limitation. Uh, maximum volume size was 20 megabytes. Megabytes are close to, but not exactly, megabytes. Uh, maximum file size was also 20 megabytes. Maximum number of files was an enormous 4,094. And uh, maximum file name length was 255 characters, although the finder had its own limitation and it didn't allow names longer than 63 characters to be created. So MFS was discontinued as the Mac's primary file system by Apple in September 1985. This marks it as Apple's shortest live file system. Uh, reading and writing to MFS volumes continued to be supported up until system 761 when Apple dropped support for writing to MFS volumes. And then all support for MFS was dropped in Mac OS 8.0 and the file system was never natively supported in Mac OS X or later. Now, that said, one of Apple's provided example file system plugins for OS X is named MFS Lives, and it provides read-only support for MFS volumes. So for those of you with that one really old floppy, there's hope. <laughs> so to replace MFS, Apple introduced the hierarchical file system, otherwise known as HFS, in September 1985. And this was a case of hardware needs driving software design because HFS was introduced to support the hard disk 20, Apple's first hard disk drive for the Macintosh. So the reason for the change is that MFS had been optimized to be used on very small and slow media, namely floppy disks. In contrast, the hard disk 20 contained an enormous 20 megabyte hard drive, which is over 50 times the data storage of the stock 400 kilobyte floppy disk. So the introduction of larger media like Apple's hard disk 20 exposed a scaling issue in MFS that needed to be addressed. So MFS's method of displaying files in a folder by searching for uh, directory and file handle pairing worked fine when you were working with you know, a few hundred kilobytes of storage and maybe 100 or so files. Now that you're dealing with megabytes of storage and thousands of files, this search method proved to be very inefficient and it had a noticeable performance impact. So Apple's solution to this problem was to replace MFS's flat file structure with a directory-based file system that leveraged a new file known as the catalog file. So this catalog file incorporated a binary search tree structure, also known as a B-tree, and this could be searched quickly regardless of the size of the storage volume. So HFS brought over uh, some changes from uh, MFS, including the use of resource forks, and also having a num uh, maximum file name length of 255 characters, although the finder imposed a further limitation and said you couldn't use more than 31 characters. So this is even less than what you had with like earlier versions of system uh, one and two, but this is still a finder limitation rather than an HFS limitation. So HFS also introduced new features, including actual directories, starting a hierarchy. It's a radical concept. 
And files were also now referenced by the file system with unique file identifiers rather than by the file name. So you can name the file almost anything without losing track of which application was supposed to be able to open it. And the designers of HFS also redeveloped various file system structures in order to be able to handle larger numbers. Most of them were upgraded from MFS's 16-bit integers to now using 32-bit. Now, there was one place where upsizing did not take place, and that was in the number of files supported. This remained a 16-bit integer, with HFS being able to support up to 65,535 files. And this becomes important later. So let's take a look at how it worked back in the day with HFS. So I'm just creating nested directory structure, and I'm going to stick a file down at the bottom of it. And pop up get info. Thanks to the B-tree, it's able to figure out exactly where that file is very quickly. There's, there's no performance impact. It knows exactly where it is. And you can also see from where in the get info window that we definitely have this nested hierarchical structure now that we didn't have with MFS. So HFS had the following limitation. Maximum volume size was two terabytes, though honestly, back in the day, I could not have imagined having two terabytes of storage. Um, maximum file size was two gigabytes. I did run into that limitation. Uh, no, maximum number of files, as previously mentioned, was 65,535. Maximum file name length remained 255. Finder is still limiting you to 31 characters. So along with solving MFS's issues, HFS had a few of its own. So the catalog file, which was the replacement for MFS's directory file handle pairing, stores all the file and directory records into a single data structure. So this can result in performance problems when you're multitasking, uh, because only one program at a time can write to this structure. So if an application is hogging the system, other programs are waiting for their turn to write to the catalog file. And damage to the catalog file can also result in catastrophic file system damage, because this is the only place where all your file and directory uh, records are being stored. You lose that, you pretty much, you're, you're toast. And another issue with HFS had to do with block allocation. So a storage volume is inherently divided into logical blocks of 512 bytes. HFS groups these logical blocks into allocation blocks, which can contain one or more logical blocks depending on the total size of the volume. So HFS is also using a 16-bit value to address these allocation blocks, and that limits the number of allocation blocks to 65,535. So you have the situation on HFS where it can support a maximum number of 65,535 files, each file is assigned at least one allocation block in the file system, and this was regardless of the size of the storage volume. So this maximum limit also introduces, as a logical consequence, a minimum file size limit, where any file could not be smaller than one allocation block or 165,535th of the size of the disk. You're saying, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, when available drives are well under one gigabyte in size, it wasn't a problem, but as drives got larger, the smallest amount of space that any file could occupy becomes excessively large. So to illustrate the issue, let's take a look at how HFS operates on a one gigabyte disk, which at this, today, one gigabyte is nothing. So one gigabyte divided by 65,535 comes out to around 16 kilobytes. And in fact, the, founder, the finder rounded it up to about 17. So that meant that the minimum file size of any file on a one gigabyte drive using HFS was effectively, dead minimum, 16 kilobytes. So even a one-byte file is now taking up 16,000 times its own size on the file system. So for users with a lot of small files, this meant that a lot of disk space could be lost to this minimum file size limitation. So to fix this storage allocation issue and to add other improvements, Apple introduced another file system in 1998. So HFS Plus was uh, introduced with macOS 8.1 in 1998, and it was designed to fix the block allocation issue in HFS. And this was accomplished by upgrading the block allocation to now use 32-bit integers in place of HFS's 16-bit, and that allowed for a much lower minimum file size. We still have it, it's still around, it's much lower, it's more manageable. And along with the block allocation issue, there were another of other issues in HFS that Apple addressed as part of creating HFS Plus. So these changes in included implementing Unicord support and also addressing the issue of long file names. So you can now actually use 255 characters in a file name. And over the years, Apple added some new features to HFS Plus. And HFS Plus was not only used on Macs. Up until this year, uh, iOS, tvOS, and watchOS were also using it, with HFS Plus being expended, extended to add support for per-file encryption. This did not get sent back to the Mac platform. We're using FileVault 2 instead. 
Um, but that was something that they did just for the mobile platforms. So, HFS Plus first shipped in 1998. 19 years ago, coincidentally, when I graduated college. Um, since that time, file systems on other platforms have shipped that include features which are not present in HFS Plus. Uh, for example, data checksumming. HFS Plus does not include the ability to check some metadata, and that helps to detect file system corruption. Uh, Timestamp granularity. HFS Plus has one second timestamp granularity. And that means that reads and writes to the file system can be tracked down to the one second mark. Other file systems are able to track this down to the nanosecond, and that allows reads and writes to be managed much better. And also, in an issue that carried over from HFS, uh, HFS Plus is also a single threaded file system. And that means that only one process can be updating the file system at any one time. So if an application is hogging the system, other programs are waiting their turn to write their data. And you may see this a lot during time machine backups. So we have some other limitations, date limitations. Uh, HFS Plus stores dates in 32 bit integers containing the number of seconds since midnight, January 1st, 1904, Greenwich Mean Time. And the consequence is that the maximum representable date is February 6, 2040 at 628 and 15 seconds AM, Greenwich Mean Time. Now, back in 1998, they probably didn't think that this was gonna be a huge issue. It's 2017, we're a bit closer to that deadline. It's time to fix that. Um, HFS Plus does not support sparse files, which are a type of computer file that attempt to use file system space more efficiently by writing reference metadata for empty space in files. So for, something that's a, for a file system that uh, supports a sparse file, what it'll do, when it knows it hits empty space in a file, it'll just say, okay, basically, you know, from here to here, it's just empty. But then it doesn't actually have to write a bunch of zeros to the file system to indicate that empty space. HFS Plus is like, oh, okay, from here to here, it's empty. <laughs> All zeros. It takes up space. It's not as efficient. Uh, HFS Plus does not support capturing file system snapshots, which means creating a read-only copy of the state that the file system was in at a specified point in time. And another legacy issue is, frankly, that HFS Plus was not designed for use with Intel processors. Motorola and PowerPC processors were what were in use when HFS Plus was designed. And the reason why this matters is that these processors were big endian and the expected transmission of order of bytes was set in one specific way. However, little Intel processors are little endian, and the expected transmission order of bytes is in the reverse order from big endian. So the consequence of this is that all metadata read from, uh, from an HFS Plus formatted drive has to be byte swapped before the processor can understand it. Now, the performance cost for this behavior is negligible, but it's something that needs to be accounted for with HFS Plus, where other file systems simply don't have this issue. So with HFS Plus showing its age and its legacy roots, Apple has made the judgment that continuing to maintain and evolve this 19-year-old file system is no longer tenable. Apple needs a new file system, and Apple File System is being born from that need. So APFS does include a number of features that are not available in HFS Plus. Uh, the first is 64-bit block allocation. So APFS uh, improves on HFS Plus's 32-bit support for block allocation by upgrading to 64-bit. And the consequence of this is that APFS can support over nine quintillion files on a single APFS volume. <laughs> in place of uh, HFS Plus's four billion and change. Um, APFS supports nanosecond timestamp granularity. This allows uh, us to track uh, reads and writes to the file system much better than HFS Plus can with its one second timestamp granularity. APFS does support the use of sparse files, and that allows APFS to handle empty space and files much more efficiently. And APFS also supports uh, capturing file system snapshots. And these snapshots are able to be mounted as read-only volumes using the mount APFS command, and I'll be getting into that in a little later. And uh, in working with nanosecond timestamping, there's also a new capability called atomic safe save. And this capability performs saves in a single transaction that they either succeed or the save didn't happen. And this saves the file system from having to deal with something making only a partial write to the file system, because often that can be worse than that uh, write not happening at all. And also, extended attribute support. Now, both APFS and a HFS Plus both support extended attributes, but HFS Plus had to have it retrofitted in. For APFS, they're simply building it in natively. So APFS is structured as shown, 
with containers being the base storage unit of APFS. Uh, containers are pools of storage, which are conceptually similar to core storage's logical volume groups. Now, in turn, the containers host APFS volumes, which are your actual mountable file systems. Each volume then maps to a matching namespace, which is uh, Apple is defining as meaning sets of files and directories. So, talking about Sierra, uh, full support for APFS is not available in Sierra at this time, but it is possible to create containers, volumes, and namespaces using DiskUtil. So let's take a look at how this works, beginning with formatting a drive to use APFS and set up one container. So first thing we're going to do is run diskutil list, and we're going to pull out the identifier of a drive that we want to format uh, as APFS. And this, this drive is currently not formatted. It's just empty. So we're going to run diskutil, partition disk. We're going to specify that the drive we want to work with is dev disk 0. We're going to specify that we want one partition, that we're using GPT for the partition table. Uh, APFS is our file system. We're going to name the drive APFS, and then we want to use 100% of the drive for this. All right? So we go through, and now we have a new drive sitting on our desktop named APFS. Now to do further work with APFS volumes, you'll need to use DiskUtil's new APFS functions in Sierra and later. Uh, to list available APFS objects, including containers and volumes, you would use diskutil APFS list. And Apple never wants you to forget in Sierra that APFS is still a work in progress, so anytime you run diskutil APFS uh, commands, you will get this warning. And Apple recognized that folks would likely want to skip this message if possible, so they did include a command line option for bypassing it. However, the bypass option makes perfectly clear Apple's guidance with regards to storing your data on APFS volumes at this time in Sierra. So once you're past the lovely warning, uh, the output of diskutil APFS list should look similar to this. So in this case, there's one APFS container and one APFS volume present on this Mac. So if you have an existing APFS formatted drive and you want to add additional containers to it, you can use the create container command. So this command will also convert an HFS plus drive to APFS and set up an empty container. So let's take a look at how this works with an HFS plus drive. So first thing we're going to run is diskutil list and grab our disk identifier for our HFS plus drive. All right, got that. Uh, next thing we're going to do is run diskutil APFS, create container, and put in dev disk 0 s2 for our identifier. All right, looks good. All right, get our lovely warning. We're going to say yes. goes through, you notice HFS Plus has disappeared from the desktop because it's unmounted. Go to diskutil APFS list to see what happened. And we do have um, the drive has been converted to APFS with an empty container inside. But again, you don't see anything mounting on the desktop. And that is because containers are your pools of storage. They are not your file system. APFS volumes are your file system, and we haven't created any of those. So until we do, nothing's going to show up for us to write to. So to destroy an existing APFS container and all the volumes and namespaces on it, you can use the delete container command. The APFS volumes are unmounted, and all APFS volumes are deleted along with their parent container. So the APFS container's former physical disk will be re reformatted as HFS plus as part of this process, and you can optionally specify a name for the HFS plus volume. Uh, if no name is chosen, it'll just be set up uh, and called untitled. So let's take a look at how this works. So first thing we're going to do is run diskutil APFS list, get our warning, say yes. Then let's go ahead and get uh, our identifier, which is disk1 s2. All right, and then run diskutil APFS, delete container, specify that we want to uh, do it to disk1 s2, and we're going to name our new HFS plus formatted drive as new HFS plus. All right, everything looks good. Hit return, get our warning, say yes. Goes through, destroys all the APFS structures on the drive, and then reformats the drive as HFS Plus, which then mounts on the desktop. So to grow a container, you would use the resize container command. And this allows the option of growing a container's available allocated space when more physical disk drive space is available. 
So if you want to have your container resized to fill all available space, you would use the number zero for the size. So first we're going to start out by running diskutil list. And we've got a drive over here that has 64 gigs of space available, but we're only using 42.7 gigs for our APFS drive. So let's go ahead and resize that. So first thing, let's go ahead and run diskutil APFS list, get past the warning. Uh, let's go ahead and get that identifier, disk1s2, one because we're going to be growing the container. And next, we're going to run diskutil APFS. Resize container. We're going to specify that we want to use dev disk one s 2 And we're going to say 0 to say that we want to use all the size. All right, goes through. Ref uh, resizes the container, and it's now using, instead of 42 gigs, it's now using the full 64 gigs available on the drive. So if you have an existing container you want to add volumes to it, you can use the add volume command. So let's go ahead and run diskutil apfs list. Get our warning, say yes. All right, I want to add another volume to disk1s2. So let's go ahead and run diskutil apfs add volume. I'm going to specify that I'm going to be adding it to disk1s2. I'm going to specify that I want it to be formatted as APFS, and that I want to call the new volume as new APFS. All right, get my warning, say yes. And out of my desktop, I have a new mountable file system appearing called new APFS. So the create verb is a convenient command that combines the functions of the create container and add, uh, add volume verbs. So it'll convert an existing HFS plus drive to an APFS drive with an empty container, and then it'll set up one APFS volume in the container. And this is, in function, it's very similar to the partition disk command that uh, we ran at the beginning. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So first, let's run diskutil list to get the identifier of our HFS plus drive, which is disk 0 s 2 And I'm going to go ahead and run diskutil APFS create, put on my disk identifier, which is dev disk 0 s 2 I'm going to specify that I want to call the new drive H uh, APFS. So say yes. Goes through, destroys the HFS plus volume. And let's take a look at how it was set up using disk util APFS list. Get our warning, say yes. And sure enough, here we have our one container and our one volume. So something to be aware of is that volumes hosted on the same container will all display the same size and available free space of their parent APFS container. So this behavior is referenced when you list the available APFS drives, and you look for the drives listed as space sharing. So let's take a look at uh, how this might look for someone with a couple of APFS volumes that are both mounted from the same container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a 10 gig file, and I'm going to put it on uh, the APFS drive and just call it 10 gig file. All right, went ahead and created it. And let's take a look at the disk usage space of both volumes. So even though I just added it to one drive, both of them are going to show up as having 10 gigs used. And the reason for that is that even though um, it only went into one volume, the underlying parent container knows it has 10 gigs used somewhere. So it takes that away from both volumes. So because free space is being managed at the container level, you shouldn't run into an issue where someone tries to save too much data to an APFS volume. But this is something to be aware of if you get asked why someone's two drives each have x gigabytes of free space each. But you can only save a total of x gigabytes onto both drives. So to help with this issue and to save on disk space overall, Apple is also introducing a new way of handling duplicate files as part of APFS. So got an HFS plus drive and an APFS drive here. And they both have 10 gig file on them. And I'm going to go over to HFS Plus, and let's just duplicate that. All right, duplicating. 
Okay, that's going to, you know, that's going to a decent clip. It'll be done in less than a minute. All right, that's fine. I'm going to go over to APFS, and it's done. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. I, I mean, do we have time to go to the bathroom? Is there a snack break that we can... Man, this is taking a, taking a very long time. So slow. Ah, finally. So, Apple calls this new copy behavior cloning, and it's defining a clone in the APFS context as being a copy of a file or directory that occupies no additional file space uh, and which can be created almost instantaneously. So when a cloned file is modified, only those modified files are being written to disk. And this allows the file system to do two things. One, store multiple revisions of the same document by tracking which blocks were used. And also, use less file storage by only tracking those changes that have been written to disk and then using the original file as a reference for the modifications. Now, I just saw the question that went on in at least a few people's heads. What happens if you throw away that original file? Nothing. The file system just, uh, just keeps reassigning those blocks as needed, just keeps reassigning, 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 until all copies of that file are gone, at which point blocks are released, and you're good to go. So it just handles this for you. You don't have to worry about it. Now, as mentioned previously, APFS includes the ability to create snapshots of the APFS file system. Now, for those not familiar with this, a snapshot is a read-only uh, instance of a file system on a volume. And these can be used to make backups work more efficiently and also a way, offer a way to revert changes to a given point in time. So in the APFS developer preview included with the current releases of Sierra, the APFS snapshot utility can be used to create, delete, and list snapshots. And Apple also noted in its APFS documentation before this note went away that the APFS snapshot utility will be disabled in a future release of macOS. So this tool is going to be superseded by another tool at some point, but it's a good way to show you how snapshots work on Sierra. So to create a new snapshot on an APFS volume, run the command shown on the screen with root privileges. So let's take a look. So we're going to go ahead and run sudo APFS snapshot dash C. And we're going to specify that we're going to call it uh, new snapshot and that it should be associated with volumes APFS. All right, put in our password for sudo. Get a different warning. Couldn't just stick with one warning. Apple's like, nope, got to have a different one just for this tool. So to list the available snapshots in an APFS volume on Sierra, you would run the command shown on the screen with root privileges. So let's go ahead and run sudo APFS snapshot dash L and ask for the list on volumes APFS. Put in our password for sudo. And we get our lovely warning again, but now we also get this list right underneath the warnings to let us know that new snapshot is there. And to delete a snapshot on an APFS volume, you would run the command shown on the screen with root privileges. So let's go ahead and run sudo APFS snapshot dash D, we're going to specify that we want to delete new snapshot from volumes APFS. All right, put in our password for sudo, get our warning, but let's just make sure it's gone. So we're going to run sudo APFS snapshot dash L for volumes APFS. And we get our warning, and this time, new snapshot doesn't appear on the list. So to mount an existing snapshot as a read-only volume, you would use the mount APFS commands dash S option. So as part of using the command, you'll also need to specify a directory for the snapshot to mount to. So once the drive is mounted, you should see it appear as a read-only drive in the finder. And you can also find out information about how the snapshot is mounted by using the mount command. So, Let's take a look at where I might have a bad day. So first thing, let's go ahead and create a 10 gig file um, that I'm just going to call 10 gig file and put on volumes APFS. All right. Very important file, clearly very important. Can't possibly lose it. Uh, so how do I make sure it's safe? Oh, I, I'll make a snapshot. I'll do that. So I'll run sudo apfs snapshot dash c. 
and I'll call it 10 gig snap, and I'll associate it with volumes APFS. Okay, life's good, all right. And here's where my day goes bad. What am I doing? No, no! Ah! I have a snapshot. Wait, I, I, I can fix this. I can fix this, how do I fix this? Uh, first thing I need to do is make a mount point. So uh, what should I call it? Uh, call it recovery, I'll put it on the desktop. Okay, all right, life is good. Okay, all right, okay, hopefully this works. Uh, and next I'm gonna run mount APFS, use the dash S option. I'm gonna specify that I wanna use 10 gig snap from volumes APFS. Oh man, I hope this works. Very important file. And all right, mount point, mount point. I gotta put on desktop recovery. That's gotta be the mount point. Okay. Please, 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 please. Okay. Uh, am, am I gonna be okay? Let's go over there. Whew. Saved. I'll have a roof over my head for one more day. Okay, also because bad things can happen to good drives, if you want to fix a malfunctioning APFS drive, you can run the FSIC APFS command with root privileges. So let's go ahead and run uh, disk util list because we want to pull out our drive identifier, which in this case is uh, disk one S2. And next we're gonna run sudo FSIC APFS. I'm gonna specify that we wanna run it on disk one S2. All right, put in our password for sudo. Everything looks like it's good. Now, one area affected by the disk check is that uh, Sierra's OS installer fails right away when you try to install it onto an APFS formatted drive. And the reason for the failure is that the disk check in the OS installer is not expecting an APFS formatted drive, and it'll cause the install process to just hard fail when the disk check fails. So, at least as of 10.12.5, can install Sierra onto a uh, APFS disk. And one of the items that Apple's been promising as part of the move to, uh, from a HFS Plus to APFS is a smooth conversion process. And the tool Apple will be using for this conversion process is called APFS HFS Convert, and it is available in Sierra. So I've tested the conversion process in Sierra, and it works as long as the conditions listed on the screen apply. So these rules may not apply entirely to the conversion process in future OS versions I can't talk about. This is just for Sierra. So to run the conversion uh, process, first make sure that all the conditions on Sierra have been met. And once they have been, you would run the command shown on the screen with root privileges. So let's take a look at how this works. So first thing, let's run disk util list. And I've got my drive identifier here, disk one S2. All right, looks good. Next thing I wanna do is run disk util unmount because the drive can't be mounted. We're gonna specify that we want to unmount HFS to APFS. All right, let's clear. And next, let's go ahead and run that conversion process. So we're gonna run sudo APFS HFS convert. And we're gonna specify that we wanna run it in verbose mode. And that we wanna to apply it to dev disk one S2. Now this is an empty drive, so the conversion process will happen fairly quickly. All right, put in our password for sudo. Get our warning, again, pre-release. Don't put any data you trust on it. Goes through, converts it. As you can see, it's an empty drive. Conversion took four seconds. Your mileage may vary the more data you have on your system. Last but not least, let's look at disk to list. It's an APFS volume. Let's get the identifier for it out, so disk 2s1. And let's go ahead and uh, mount it again, so disk util mount, dev disk 2s1. Goes ahead and mounts it. Last but not least, let's check it with disk util APFS list. And sure enough, it's an APFS formatted drive with a container and a volume setup. Now, when I've tested it converting encrypted drives in Sierra, I get results that look like this. 
the conversion process fails with an error, and the drive winds up in a state that disk utility labels as uninitialized, and it's not possible to mount the drive. So I really don't recommend doing this in Sierra. When I've tested converting Fusion drives in Sierra, I get results that look like this. APFS HFS convert gives me a message that I've targeted a core storage logical volume, which I knew, it's a Fusion drive, and the process halts at that point. No conversion takes place. So no converting the Fusion drives in Sierra. So there are currently several limitations of APFS on Sierra to be aware of. Um, an APFS volume cannot be used as a startup disk. Uh, with regards to case sensitivity, APFS volumes can only be case sensitive, which can cause some problems for software. Uh, time machine backups are not currently supported. And also, core storage is staying behind on HFS Plus. It's not making the move over to APFS. And since both file vaults and fusion drives both rely on core storage, they are also not making the move over to APFS. For encryption, APFS includes its own native encryption uh, element built in, so we don't need core storage's encryption. And for fusion drives, I'm just, I don't know what they're doing, but hopefully they handle it. So that's the state of APFS on Sierra. What about on High Sierra? So Apple made some public statements about APFS at WWDC, which means that I can talk about them. So among those statements is that APFS is the new default file system. So they're planning for when you upgrade to 1013, you're going to be upgrading to APFS as part of this. They've already rolled this out for iOS, tvOS, and watchOS. And as far as I can tell, the world didn't end. So hopefully it's going to be good for macOS as well. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting was after making it case sensitive by default on Sierra, they flipped back and said, okay, we're doing case insensitive uh, volumes by default on APFS. Well, I'm like, all right. Also, supports Unicode 9.0. Why is this important? Emoji support. That's right, APFS supports your emojis. Uh, they also said that snapshots are supported on High Sierra. They also said uh, Fusion volumes are supported on High Sierra. I'm still not quite clear on how that's working. Um, and also, they do have full volume encryption support available on High Sierra. So, snapshots. So to create a snapshot on an APFS boot volume, you need to use TMUtil because currently, uh, Time Machine is the only uh, software that seems to have the correct entitlements on High Sierra needed to work with snapshots. So, to create a snapshot, you run TMUtil snapshot. And let's take a look at how that works. And you don't need root privileges for this. This is something that can be just run as your regular standard user. So you just run tmutil snapshot, creates a local snapshot, gives you a date. And the interface for accessing the snapshot's contents is the time machine interface and the associated command line tools like tmutil. Now when time machine is using a snapshot, you can find out information about how the snapshot is mounted by using the mount command. And the snapshot should be mounting by default into slash volumes. And if your finder sidebar showing uh, allows the display of external mounted drives, when you enter Time Machine, you should see the mounted snapshot appear when you enter Time Machine. So let's take a look at how snapshots work as part of Time Machine. So you know what? Never liked you word. Just going to get rid of you. Oh, I, I, I don't need you. You just take up space in my file system. Yeah, let's go ahead and get rid of it. Wait, what's that? I got a, I, a Word document? Really? Oh, man. Oh, now I got to go get it back. All right, going into Time Machine. Going to go to my snapshot. Can't believe I got to get Word back. All right, there's Word. Go ahead, hit Restore. Goes through, retrieves from the snapshot. Ask me for permission, because of course I'm restoring back to something that needs admin privileges. And let's go ahead and launch Word. And 
same word spec. I can work with that document. Curse you, word. <laughs> so, because you can never have too much information about uh, a new subject, here's some useful links. Some more useful links. Possibly the most important links you see in this entire presentation. This is how you get it all. Uh, PDF is available from the top link. And keynote slides, which include the movies, which contain the speaker's notes, which contain the everything, are available by uh, the link below. And with that, I'll leave that up on the screen, and I will open the floor for questions. Is that a question, or? OK. Uh, whoa. Hello. It's OK. Uh, up, up front here. And it looks like we have about uh, 30 minutes for questions. So my question is, like, is there any support for adding multiple devices to a storage pool? Uh, so this is part of Sierra. So uh, the answer is sort of. What Apple has said is basically you can create an APFS volume on top of an existing RAID. So you can create a software RAID and then convert that software RAID to APFS. Um, ditto if you have a hardware RAID, you can format that as APFS. By itself, APFS really doesn't include multi-volume support. So it's, it's along the lines of, as, as long as it's like a single volume from APFS's point of view, it can work with that. But it needs to have that underlying RAID structure set up for it. Is there anything to try to combat like bit rot, like any kind of parity or? Uh, does it check some metadata, I think, is what you're trying to ask? Uh, the answer there, let me see if I can find Apple's actual answer, because I don't quite remember what it was. Hold, please. This is why it's always useful to include as part of the useful links the actual documentation, because they have this as part of the FAQ. Frequently asked questions. Oh yes, what has Apple done to ensure the reliability of my data? They also answered the can RAID be used with the Apple file system question. Um, so basically they uh, don't do a ton in the file system to prevent that. What they do is they try to build that support into the hardware uh, and have the hardware ECC correction take care of it. Is that sufficient? I think that's going to be kind of dependent on your data needs. Um, but that would be the kind of thing if you really need that kind of, you know, absolutely positively no data ever gets lost, that I must have the checksumming metadata and everything else, maybe you want to look at a different file system for that. But uh, APFS, Apple's like, we think that doing a lot of uh, redundant checking and everything else will hurt performance, and we want to have that performance, so we're not going to do that. Any other questions? Can we expect with older snapshots to develop a lot of, um, or for free file system space to start disappearing as the drift increases, kind of like you do with VM these days? That is a good question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough experience with snapshots on high Sierra to answer that question. Um, on Sierra, with the APFS snapshot tool, when it created a snapshot, it used up as much space in the snapshot as it was backing up. So like when I was backing up that 10 gig file, the snapshot was 10 gigs in size. Uh, the snapshot ability in High Sierra has gotten more efficient um, to the point where I created a snapshot of my whole boot volume and it didn't noticeably take up a ton of space. But 
that's going to be one of those questions that I think Apple's going to have to answer. I simply don't know at this point. Questions? Questions? Oh, question over here. That um, quick file duplication that you showed, was that within one volume or does that work within containers? That is a good question. That is within uh, one volume. Um, it should work within containers. I have not tested that. I do know that if you take it over to another drive, uh, if, you, if you copy a file to like another APFS you know, formatted drive where it's separate containers and everything else, it will make a complete copy. It doesn't do the, the cloning across physical disk boundaries. And so while the mechanics are different, is this conceptually similar to what you would accomplish with a hard link? Uh, yes and no, because a hard link is a file structure. I mean, that's not something I think, well, it is, it is built into the file system, but uh, That is a good question. I'm, I'm not able to articulate coherently the difference. There, there is a difference, I just can't articulate it well. <laughs> Any other questions? Invective, abuse? Uh, I saw in the, uh, the WWC, WWDC, uh, I think it was in the keynote, they mentioned that it was kind of optimized for flash storage. Yes. Does it still work effectively on those of us who still have machines that have spinning hard drives? Yes. Um, it is optimized for flash. Uh, my understanding, based on my testing, it does work on spinning disk. However, if you have spinning disk, um, you may do better to stay on HFS plus until you can get off of spinning disk. You did everything in command line. Is there going to be availability of just opening up disk utility and, and doing it uh, without command line? In Sierra, no. In High Sierra, yes. And then I'm a little confused. You said uh, Time Machine is not supported, and yet you went into Time Machine to restore the Snapchat. Time Machine is not supported in Sierra. As you can see in High Sierra, it's a different story. Yeah, most of this presentation, unless I specifically called it out as being High Sierra, it applies to Sierra. Because there's a lot about APFS on High Sierra I can't talk about <laughs> because of the NDA. I was able to show what I could because it was called out by Apple publicly in their own APFS session. Okay, this is gonna be a twofer for the file vault expert. Um, with the encryption in the new file system, what's the future of file vault? Well, I guess that depends on how you're defining file vault. If you're defining it as the core storage file vault, that stops with HFS plus. If you're defining file vault as uh, the APFS encryption, that will of course continue on with APFS. It, it, file vault is a marketing term. So it's a different file vault? It is a different encryption solution. It is not, it doesn't have, the two do not share things in common. They work differently. I was really hoping Apple would give it a different file name on ICR, but they don't appear, appear to have done so. So going forward, will we have to decrypt our existing file vault drives to convert it to APFS? Apple has promised a smooth conversion process and past that is covered by the <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, Unfortunately, I really can't comment on that at this time. Um, with Hi Sierra, is there anything that they have stated about how users are gonna reserve space for snapshots. No. I mean, in any way. No.
I'm glad you phrased it that way because otherwise I'd be like, I can't answer because of the NDA. But you said, have they stated? And I'm, no. Um, with, uh, again, on snapshots in High Sierra, it, uh, it didn't seem that you could specify a location for the snapshot. Like, it's, you just create a snapshot. More details on that are going to be covered by the NDA. Um, I will say I have not seen anything from Apple indicating that you can transport snapshots between physical disks. With that, with that, does that then mean that Time Machine as we see it now is fully dependent on snapshots? Or will it also, does it also currently support regular targeted backup? That is covered by the NDA, and unfortunately, I can't answer that one. Sadly, most of the high zero questions, I'm going to answer that way. You're uh, going to yeah, have to ask is, Apple. This is probably uh, the same idea. Um, as for backwards compatibility in High Sierra, do you know if File Vault 2 will still be supported? Uh, it, uh, that is an excellent question that is covered under the NDA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where if you're talking an HFS Plus drive, I haven't seen anything that would say it wouldn't, but that's all I can say. Any more questions? Comments? That, sir? I heard that we'll be able to change partitions on the fly. Is that? I, uh, are we talking on Sierra or are we talking on High Sierra? <laughs> <laughs> I know you can't do it with Sierra, so I guess you can't talk about it. Uh, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't. Unless no. Apple talked about it, I can't talk about it. Yeah. They did talk about resizing partitions on the, what'd they say? We should, we should get the microphone back to you. I watched the, the, uh, the file system session in researching for the workshop, and they talked about space sharing in uh, APFS. And used the example of, this is a problem, a chronic problem, anytime you partition a drive into two sections, you always end up with too much space on one and not enough on another. So let's say you've got an OS space and an application space. And you need to make that OS space like 10 gigs bigger. And you've got 50 gigs of free space on your user space. With the current HFS, you can't do that. You actually have to like back up, delete the second partition, sh expand the first one, and then uh, re you know, recreate and restore your, your, your user partition. This was all within the same container though, right? Right. Okay. In, um, you know, what they're talking about is space sharing in, in High Sierra and the ability to basically just take that space off another volume. And, because again, when you have, once it's a, it's a yeah, pool, it's they all sharing. appear to yeah. have the same amount of free space and the same capacity anyway, so it, it blurs the lines a little bit. That, that's a good note, and I missed that one. That, that uh, did you have that uh, file systems in your notes, that session? No, I didn't. Okay, that's. I think it's in the ones for the workshop that will we'll, for the the Mac management workshop. It's in those notes. So okay. if you want to download those when they're posted. Yep. Any other questions, comments, statements, manifestos? Oh. Ah, maybe not manifestos. <laughs> we only have 17 minutes. I think with respect to the hard link question. I believe snapshots on APFS use copy on write. Is that? Yes. OK. And there is no copy on write on HFS plus, right? Correct. So I think that's probably the difference. Hard links don't use copy on write. Snapshots do. Does that sound right? Well, and, uh, as for the difference, uh, I, know, I know there's some other 
fiddly bits in there, but that, but yeah, definitely APFS supports copy on write, HFS plus does not, and that is one definitely one difference between the two. Comments, questions? Are there any questions about icons? <laughs> We're very proud of that app. Oh, all right. Since you prompted, um, I would think the shaky icon would draw the user's attention more and they would click on it accidentally instead of the non-shaky icon. <laughs> Well, that, that, is the, that is the plus of the, uh, you know, the, the fact that clicking that X doesn't actually do anything. They still need to hit the actual button to make it uninstall, at least through uh, Jam Pro self-service and also through Managed Software Center. It's just a nice visual cue. So I'm still a little confused about the hierarchy of containers versus volumes, or is there some analogy to that? Uh, so you know what I'm saying? Let's let's know. go take a look at that diagram again. I am indebted to Stephen Foskett for uh, making this uh, because this is basically how it works. So you've got physical disk up there, then at the next level you've got APFS containers. Then you've got, and you, as you can see, you can have more than one container on a volume, uh, excuse me, on a physical disk. And then from there, you have branching out your volumes and honestly, namespaces, yeah, it's just directories and files. I wouldn't worry too much about namespaces. Uh -huh. So does the, does the diagram help or? Yes. Okay. And it, so that basically adds a new layer of, of control. Yes. Thank you. Sure thing. So in this diagram, where does the concept of a partition fit? Is that at the disk level? Is that at the container level? I would say, so when it comes to partition, um, it would be coming more at the container level because that's what's governing your pool of storage. So, so when you, but when you, when, well, okay. Okay, I think I understand it, maybe? All right. Yeah. I mean, it gets weird because you would normally think of a partition as something that you could mount, but in this case, the containers don't mount. Right. So... But yeah, it would, you know, basically it's like, this is where your, you know, your storage is being managed from. This is where your volumes get mounted from. But at the disk level, you could also have an HPFS partition. Oh, sure, or, yeah, you can, you can slice up your physical disk however okay. you like. All right, thanks. Sure thing. So if I understood you correctly, you were saying that maybe uh, for spinning disks, this wouldn't be the way to go. Uh, this would so, be, that would be something that I would evaluate for your own needs through testing. But High Sierra will require it if one decided to upgrade on mm -hmm. machine or you still have the option? Uh, it just comes as the default, but. I would say it comes as the default on new stuff Apple is selling you. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's going to depend because I don't know of any spinning disks that Apple's currently selling. Uh, well, there's fusion drives. Well, I've but, got plenty of inventory yeah. with spinning yeah. disks. But I don't know of any laptops or desktops that Apple's selling these days that does not include SSDs. Mm -hmm. So for your older stuff, I don't know. Like I said, that's going to be something that's going to have to come, uh, be tested and verified for yourself. Thank you. When you were talking about uh, um, upgrading uh, to APFS from an encrypted disk, File Vault 2, mm -hmm. it becomes an unmountable drive? On so, Sierra. On Sierra. So, so w it, when, when you have Sierra and, and uh, your machine's encrypted, uh, will you have to uncrypt in order to install High Sierra? Apple has promised a smooth conversion process. <laughs>
Oh, wow. That is surprising. I would have thought it would have all switched to SSD by this point. So you're a large disk file, or large file duplicate that you did that you know, worked about instantly. We've effectively got um, deduplication going on block level for that stuff. No. It's not deduplication? It is. In fact, Apple specifically calls that out in their fact. Um, does Apple file system support data du duplication? And the answer is no. Okay. Uh, they're using that. cloning instead to help minimize the amount of uh, file, you know, file system overhead with uh, copies, but they're not doing deduplication. Okay. Got it. Questions, comments? Oh, question. Um, I, I did uh, upgrades to beta 1 and then beta 2. And in the uh, like recovery mode, obviously, there's still the recovery partition. But you can see the snapshots in the, um, uh, in, in the disk manager for I don't know, that, is it, do you know any way to change like a master boot record to point to a particular snapshot volume yet? So the point is I bricked and I could have gone maybe uh, back to the other snapshot. I'm just going to say no because I don't. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, if I did know that, it would be under the NDA at this point. <laughs> but I can honestly say I have no idea. Okay. That's conclusive. Thank you. Um, with what we currently know, can you put HFS volumes on top, uh, HFS plus volumes on top of APFS containers? No. No? Anything else? Any other comments? Any other questions? Okay, so I apologize if I used the wrong terms here because this container stuff still is kind of fuzzy. But if you have a, a container uh -huh. and then you inside the container you have two volumes, let's say, yeah, that helps. So let me do it this way. You have your disk and you have two containers inside the disk. Mm -hmm. And so let's say your total disk is a 500 gigs. Right. And you have a 100 gig container and a 200 gig container and then you have 300 gigs of space left over. Right. Your containers won't grow. They're defined at that size. Is that correct? You can use the resize container command to help grow them, and you can define how much they grow. Okay, but they won't do it on their own. Correct. Okay. Thanks. No problem. All right, any more questions? Because if not, we get to leave seven minutes early.